Hi everybody, in this video I'm going to talk about different uh, computer network organizations and how database management systems take part in these or different organizations. Uh, we're going to first start with teleprocessing, concept of teleprocessing. Uh, in teleprocessing you have a one computer and it has a sing, sing, single central processing unit. And there are multiple thermal computers, they all connect to this one computer with the processing unit. Uh, terminals are considered dumb because they don't actually perform the tasks or processes. They're, they're, they just provide basic interface for, for the users. And users use this interface and the actual bulk of the tasks get done in these central computers. So basically they take user preferences data send it to uh, this central computer where the tasks get done there and then they show the present the results in the user interface uh, but this was a more of a older system the modern pcs they are high performance and you can actually get done a lot of tasks a lot of the applications can run on the actual pc instead of running on a server and uh, when you have all the tasks run on a mainframe it can be expensive to invest in all these mainframes so sometimes it's better to delegate tasks process to be completed in the client's computer uh, the next architecture is the file server architecture uh, usually it's file so typically file server architecture use a local area network and it has a file server which is a shared resource and it stores all the uh, shared content media or other type of data um, such as videos images uh, other files etc and uh, the workstations in the in the file server architecture have actually a better processing power so they actually run the applications and the database management systems in the workstations and whenever they need a file they communicate with the file server and they fetch the files from the file server uh, one problem with this uh, architecture is that it really increases network traffic so every time a workstation needs a file it needs to communicate with the file server and they also each run their own database so for, you need uh, PCs that can get these tasks done and uh, on the other hand using network making a busy network can cause performance problems uh, the two-tier client server architecture um, <clears throat> tries to tackle some of these problems and basically uh, to, to your client server tries to uh, layerize the architecture so you have two different layers uh, one there's the server then there's the clients and the reason for that is usually data intensive business apps have four major components and these components are the actual data the database uh, where you keep the data and the transaction logic business and data application logic uh, so your business related data related calculations these make up the um, this application logic and the user interface where you actually present and show the uh, the results or or also the place where you take the user preference and user data and <clears throat> now the two tier client server provides basic separation of these components basically more you can separate these components uh, you know more efficient your system is going to get therefore in two tier client server these components are uh, vaguely separated not not a complete separation but you know part of it in one layer the other part is in the other layer for example user interface is in the client layer uh, business and app data logic partially is in the client layer and database and transaction logic are in the server.
typically users uh, make a request to the server through the client, through the user interface. So for example, you want to um, load the list of, say, uh, products of your um, online store, right? So you choose, a, so you click on the link on your computer, right? And then this goes to the server, server processes this. Um, it fetches the data from the database and it creates a response. It puts all the data into response, sends it back to the client. And in the client, the user interface reads this data and parses it into HTML or any other protocol format. Uh, if you're working with the website, it's going to be HTML, right? The server is going to fetch data, parse it into some uh, HTML and then send it to client. And the browsers, which make up the uh, client program, also the user interface, it's going to read this data and create an HTML page for humans to see and understand. And depend on, depending on the request, the server may send back media content or, as I said, data from the database. It can be uh, flat files, text files, images, audio, etc. Anything that uh, depends on this request. Now, in <clears throat> with these uh, architectures, there may be some application programs. Usually, application programs you have uh, SQL code. Uh, SQL, the language for the database, is embedded inside them. For example, let's say I'm writing a Java program, and inside the Java program, I add some SQL code, and this SQL code uh, runs queries for the database. So if I want to create a new user for my, um, create a new guest for my restaurant, so I, you know, I, I first design the interface where you can enter the guest name, uh, last name, maybe credit card, etc., and then this data is read from the through through Java interface. Maybe you can design the interface with Java Swing, so you you get text boxes, etc., and then you place a button. When you click the button, save button, right? This button uh, you you put a event handler where it fetches all the user data, right, and then puts this into a query, which is embedded in the Java. And uh, through the necessary database libraries, this query is run in the database, in the server. And it actually saves the data into the server. Same way you can read the data from the server. But you have to write your SQL query and put it in the application program. So you may be writing this program with Java, with C Sharp, some other language. Basically, you just embed the SQL code in there, so people don't have to run the code because no anybody who's running this application they don't want to deal with SQL. So your application has to deal with SQL for them. Um, Two-tier client server enables wider access to existing databases, increases performance because uh, it separates the layers, right? Reduced hardware costs, so you don't have to invest in expensive mainframes to do all the processing. Uh, you can partially run some of the logic on the client computers. Uh, less communication, uh, for example, you can deal with some kind of data validation, user data validation in the client side, as opposed to doing, doing it on the server. It will save you some traffic, right? So if the user didn't enter a correct email address format, then you don't even bother to send it to server, you just check it in the client. So some of the logic is performed on the client side. The next one is the three-tier client server architecture. Basically, three-tier client server architecture uh, advanced the two-tier client server architecture by adding another layer, which is the application server. So you actually have um, First tier, which is the user interface. The second tier is application server. So where, that's where the application runs. And application, in, so be, the reason for this is you don't want application to run on the client or most of it. So you take some of the burden from the client. And application server runs there. 
and uh, the business logic happens here. So any kind of calculation data processing happens in the application server. And in the third tier, you have the database server where the data is actually saved. Uh, the data is read from there, uh, saved into there. So it's stored in the database server. But uh, separating application server and and the, and the database server has some benefits. Uh, these benefits are, first of all, the client doesn't need to have uh, expensive resources, right? That's some of the, proce the processing is taken away from the client. So the client does minimal processing. Uh, the processing is put on the application server. Now, the, the maintenance is easier because you have different layers, uh, you have the user interface, you have the application backend, and then you have the database. If something wrong with the database, it's isolated. So uh, it's easier to maintain and more specialized. If there's a problem with the application, you can focus on the application layer. You don't need to worry about other layers. Or again, if something is broken in the user interface, you can focus on that part. So things are easier to repair, easier to um, maintain. And separation of core business logic from the database functions. Uh, this basically specializes each layer. And it's great for the web environment. It's a natural architecture for the web environment. Uh, think of it, the web browser that you use to access web pages, etc. It's the client. It's the client user interface. So that's how you see all the data that is sent to you. And it's considered as a thin client because it doesn't have to process a lot of things. Uh, things you can process with the web browser is limited. On the other hand, application servers, um, they do, do all the calculations and logic again, and the data is stored in the database. So it works great for the internet. Next architecture is web services and service oriented architectures. Web services don't actually have a user interface. They are not meant to be run by the client directly. Instead, they allow applications to integrate with other applications across the internet, or it doesn't have to be in the internet. It can be desktop applications too. Web services, usually they provide some kind of service or some kind of data or some kind of functionality. Uh, for example, uh, you can check out the open weather map. So this is a weather app and it provides uh, weather data. So if you want to integrate weather data into your application, you can use the service. Right. And these services usually work with some kind of data format. It can be JSON or XML. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, as you can see here. And XML stands for Extensible Markup Language. Uh, they are both used to organize and store data, uh, transfer data. And JSON is really popular lately for a while because it's really easy to process using JavaScript, and a lot of the client uh, scripting is done by with, with JavaScript for most pages, some, some kind of JavaScript frameworks. Uh, here, as you can see, the API call, the format. So you have to call this link, and you insert a city name, and it returns you the data. For example, for London, Here's an example they give. So you can actually embed these links into your website on the client side. So let's see what happens. Click on that. And this is JSON notation. It's actually uh, designed after JavaScript objects. So this is an object, coordinates. It has longitude and latitude for, for the location. And then we have the weather, right? So it's light intensity, drizzle, etc. some. Oh, Cloud, is it cloudy or is it windy? So all kinds of data comes with it. Now you can actually process this uh, in the client side. You can create some graphics to present this. 
for your users or you know you can just make a list make just raw data make it more presentable so this is how the web services work uh, some other web service examples are Google Maps you can use Google Maps as a web service and there are a lot of different kinds of web services usually when you use a when you write a web service actually we will write some web services for this class in in some of the exercises and you write a web service basically when a link is called when you make a call to a certain link uh, that will that may retrieve some data from the server from from the database and send it back for in this case with the open weather map uh, they have a database about the weather so when we make a call to that link when we click on that link here it searches in the database with the London it finds the latest um, data set for London and it parses it as an HTML, sends it back as a response, and my client, my web browser, which is, which is the client here, also the user interface, uh, presents it to me as a JSON. But again, you can change your client to present in a different way, which you would have to write some JavaScript code for that. The last architecture we're going to talk about is cloud computing. According to Microsoft, cloud computing is simply delivery of computer services. And these, server, these services can include servers, storage, database, networking, software, analytics, and a lot more. Uh, the thing is, they have resources and clients or customers, they pay to use these resources. So let's say you have, you're starting up your company, you have a startup company, right? Now you can choose to go drop tons of money buy all kinds of equipment software uh, certifications licenses hardware like you need to buy a server you need to buy database by database um, database management systems or a computer to run these things physical hardware and all kinds of software and you have to have people who will have to maintain these uh, who have to watch that everything goes well with these things and if anything breaks down there's you know these people have to come in and fix it and you have to put these people on payroll and on the other hand you need to make sure these things are in physically safe condition um, they're continuously operating and then you should also consider the security issues right so you need to take precautions against hackers, etc. But it gets it really adds up and becomes an expensive thing. Instead of this, you can use a cloud computing service such as Amazon Web Services. There's a Google Cloud. There's a Microsoft Azure. And these basically these companies they have all these resources. They have all this hardware, storage, the software. They have the staff members that will uh, provide the support if anything goes wrong you know depending on different plans uh, different payment options you, you may get 24 7 support uh, and a lot of companies they choose the service these types of services instead of dealing everything themselves uh, they use the cloud and they put place their applications on the cloud and uh, it has a lot of advantages such as saving costs improved security um, you know you they can focus on whatever applications they want to build instead of uh, dealing with all these hardware software resource issues etc uh, other things are it's easier to scale cloud because um, you you need to increase your database storage okay you pay more and then they can just scale your uh, resources for that and uh, they improve a lot better security because security is really expensive more expensive than a lot of startups can um, afford for or some other companies even middle-sized companies 
even for them it's still expensive and you know they already have security so uh, you may you may purchase some additional security features but it, the whole thing also comes with some certain level of security and uh, physically it's secure other than that uh, it's reliable cloud is more reliable unless there's some major disaster happens cloud should be very reliable and usually in a, whenever there's a new technology comes up it becomes available on the cloud right away pretty fast because there's also think of all these companies are competing to get more customers so they would have to include new technology pretty fast um, and that's it for the cloud computing so we're going to in the next video we're going to create a PHP app and we're going to use the Amazon web services for that so go to this link aws.amazon.com slash account and get a free account and in the next video we're going to create a PHP app on the cloud